Okay. Uh, thank you, Vin Kent. All right. I'm sure some of y'all that were here last week are probably thinking to yourself, all right, with what he covered on evangelism last week, what in the world has he got left he could say in another three weeks? Truth of the matter of it is, there's a lot that can be covered and a lot of examples that can be related as to lives that have been impacted by those that have been willing to take the time to share the good news with them in order to change as many lives as possible. You know, I remember singing the song years ago, bringing in the cheese, uh, excuse me, bringing in the sheaves. Had no clue what that meant, you know? Uh, of course, fortunately, I had an uncle that was a farmer. He explained to me sheaves is when you stack grain together in bundles waiting for it to be harvested. And uh, I'm like, okay, and that explains. So you're talking about a harvest. And so then it made sense when uh, we know that the related to us is that uh, the fields are white with harvest and yet the laborers are few. And of course, so you wonder about well, why are the labors for few? Why does God not send more evangelists? Well, he has. It's just they don't want to do what they're supposed to do. Because each and every one of us has a responsibility of relating to every individual we come across the good news. That is our prime and main concern. And then taking the opportunity to mentor them, to teach them the things that Christ has taught us. I was reading an article by Jennifer Riley. Uh, she wrote uh, for several years until passing for a Christian magazine. And back in 2009, she had done a survey and found out that 58% of confessing Christians said that the Holy Spirit uh, was not a being, was not God, was a force, and that uh, Satan was a concept not an actual individual now that was in 2009 that was 58 percent of professing christians that she spoke with that's pretty alarming when you think about the fact that the empowerment that we have to be able to speak the good news to others comes from the holy spirit it's not within ourselves we're not even really responsible to do anything but what the holy spirit tells us to do to reach out to those that he guides us to and gives us those opportunities to speak to one each individual. Years ago, uh, back in November of 1965, I don't know if how many of you young people can remember that far back, but I do. I was 13 years old at the time. And in town for a 10 day crusade came a gentleman by the name of Billy Graham to the Astrodome. And my parents brought me with them to listen to Billy Graham. Now I had accepted Christ as my savior and my Lord before that uh, incident. And that was possibly why that they wanted to bring me was just for me to hear somebody that had a very simple message, very simple message. In fact, on that 10 day crusade, over 380,000 people attended the crusade in those 10 days. The Astrodome was definitely crowded, I could tell you that much. He conducted over 417 such crusades between 1947 and 2005. 2005 was his last major crusade. But, you know, he... Uh, had over 61,000 people with the last day that attended that uh, crusade at the Astrodome. In fact, President Johnson and the First Lady flew to Houston from the LBJ Ranch to attend. And uh, he was a close friend, counselor to the Johnsons, and he uh, made quite a few uh, visits to the White House during the Johnson administration. I don't know how much well that President Johnson listened to him, but uh, you know there was a good relationship there. And uh, if you will go back to archive footage, uh, you can see it on uh, channel KHOU Channel 11's uh, archives. You can actually see that finale of uh, Billy Graham as he spoke. And uh, hundreds of attendees gathered on the floor together to pray at the end of 
the altar call. And then when uh, Graham issued the Astrodome and with the Johnsons, the president shook hands with people lined up along the motorcade. You know, he was always one to reach out to be friendly. Point being, though, is that uh, having been able to sit there and listen to Billy Graham, the simple message had such great power. It was awesome to see the hundreds of people going down to front. Now, the good thing was, is that I found out later, because my mom started taking Decision Magazine, which was a publication by Billy Graham Evangelistics uh, Group, about the fact that they would come in, a team came in early to work with churches throughout the area of where a crusade was going to be held, to where that they would have volunteers from the churches down on the floor when the culture call was made. So not only could they pray with these folks, but then it could also then guide them to a local church to be a member of, to be mentored, to be able to not only be made disciples of, followers of Christ, but then also to be taught all things that Christ taught us. So I really thought that that was very impressive to see just how that that functioned and how massive of a group of people it took in order to be able to put a crusade together. And yet the bottom line was everybody came to hear a very simple message. That Jesus Christ came as a babe. God and man both. Not understandable how he can be that way, but he is. He was lived a life without sin, was crucified for us, was resurrected and sits on the right hand of the Father as our intercessors our advocate so simple and yet so powerful because god's holy spirit the holy the holy spirit was moving within the group of people was it because of billy graham's own ability i think not he did just like what paul said that uh Paul planted the seeds, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. You know, God's the one that gives the increase. But if you noticed, somebody planted the seed. Somebody had to water it, depending on God to give the increase. When, uh, when I had gotten out of that crusade with my mom and dad, because parking was really fun getting out that afternoon for sure. Graham's message made me really want to tell others about Jesus. But as time went forward, I really set aside the zeal and the passion that I had to tell others about Christ, mainly because when I started telling my school friends, classmates about Jesus, got a lot of ridicule, got called a lot of things. Some things like Holy Roller and then some things not so quite nice. And that pretty much quenched my desire to speak about Christ because of fear of rejection, I guess. And unfortunately, we find that that is one of the things that holds back so many of God's children from doing what God has called us to. And that is being someone that just regardless of the situation, if we know that we are to speak of the good news, the Holy Spirit is going to give us what to say. Our only responsibility is to be the instrument. Now, one of the things that happened was I was asked questions by my schoolmates and even a teacher or two that uh, obviously were non-believers about the contradictions of the Bible. Where did the dinosaurs come from? Where did they go? Well, I mean, as far as I knew, they didn't make it to the ark. I didn't have the answer. And so just like many other Christians, you know, it's because I'm afraid that I'm not going to have the answers to the questions they ask that also helped quench my desire to reach out to others about the good news. But thankfully, that passion and that zeal has returned. 
because there are avenues that I found that I'm not responsible for, but there'd be anything but an instrument that God uses. That if somebody doesn't want to hear what I have to say, well, you know, that's not my responsibility of what decisions they make. That's between them and God. My only responsibility is to evangelize. And I like the fact that the word evangelize, like I said previously, is used 76 times in the New Testament as a noun and 54 times as a verb. So it is an action thing. And that is teaching, reaching for the good news. Just telling it forward, being a messenger of the good news. From Eu Angelas, meaning bringer of good news, herald of good news. I not, like I told you last Sunday, I like the term herald of a good news because it means somebody that sounds it like a trumpet, that wants attention called to that message so that people will hear and will be able to embrace it or at least to hear it. It's their decision of what to do. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 12, let's go there to Luke chapter 12, starting with verses 8 through 12. All right, Luke 12, verses 8 through 12 tells us, and this is Christ's own words, and I say to you, everyone who confesses me, that is Jesus Christ, before men, the Son of Man shall confess him or her also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And... Everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it will not be forgiving. Who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not become anxious about or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. Now, to me, that is applicable to God's children as a whole. That if the Holy Spirit is living within us, then he is the one that if he is allowed to sit on the throne of our heart, if he's the one to have charge of what we say, then he will give us exactly what to say in any given situation. So when we're speaking to someone that is maybe questioning us about, well, what about this in the Bible? That may be something that the Holy Spirit tells you. Well, this is an opportunity to carry this conversation on at a later date. And we'll just tell them, I don't know, but I'll be more than happy to talk with those that might be able to tell me so I can come back and tell you. Gives you another avenue. Hasn't shut everything off. Now, it was probably meant by that person to shut you off. But when you give them a response like, I'll find out for you rather than saying, you know, I don't know, or being just totally flustered and not being able to say anything else. Just give it over the Holy spirit. He will give you exactly what to say and what to do. And that I like that. It says in that very hour. So that's to me, that's immediate. It's not, you got to wait on him to, to prompt you of what to say at any given time. He will give you right then. I think our response also should always be when God puts before someone that needs to be spoken to about the good news is in Isaiah six, eight, where he says that I heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, hear my Lord, send me. That is one of the most difficult statements I think for a child of God to make because of our own nature, of our own selfish nature, wanting what we want and want to do it our way according to our plan. And it's like, well, God, I know you got a plan, but I think mine's better. And of course, that's when we find out we should listen to him to start with. 
but that's a, that's a thing that uh, we really need to be attentive to is us being one that God sends. The interesting thing about Billy Graham's end of life on uh, February 21st, 2018 is when he passed like 7.58 in the morning. Of course, that happens to be Sanders and my anniversary. So it's our, it was our 37th anniversary when he passed. But that's not the reason that I remember it so well. Uh, that helps keep it in mind when he passed. But my thinking was, who's going to take his place? You know? Here's this mighty evangelist that did all these crusades all around the world. But I don't hear of crusades like this anymore. I hear of everything else in the world that is so full of evil and so full of darkness. And yet I don't hear someone carrying the torch with the light like Billy Graham did until I kind of did a little research. Franklin Graham, his son, Samaritan's Purse. Where did our boxes for Christmas for our children come from? Samaritan's Purse. That crusade is still going on, maybe not in the same way, but God will give us avenues to reach those that are lost if we'll but just listen to his voice and allow him to show us the way. Same way as individuals, when we have an opportunity to evangelize someone, that opportunity will be given to us and the words given to us by the Holy Spirit to speak. So... Throughout his life, Billy Graham preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to some 215 million people who attended more than his more than 400 crusades, simulcast and evangelistic rallies in more than 185 countries and territories. He reached millions more through TV, video, film, the internet, and 34 books. And I thought just how awesome that was. You know, how many people he reached. And then I realized that as a Gideon, when I hand someone a scripture, I don't know how many people's lives are going to be changed with that one scripture. That uh, also needs to go with a word of testimony. And when I talk about a word of testimony, what I really like is, is that Pretty much every one of us can, in one paragraph, record our salvation experience. Sometimes it takes a little more to expand upon it when someone's curious. But it's just very simple of what change that Christ made in our lives and when. You know? My life change took place on a Sunday morning. And it wasn't an evangelistic crusade or it wasn't uh, a revival, it wasn't a youth rally or anything like that. It was just a typical Sunday morning. And I felt a tug on my heart from the Holy Spirit saying, it's time. I've called you and I want you to be a child of mine. And fortunately, after standing there for several minutes, as they sang more than one verse, they sang several. In fact, if I recall right, they actually started back over again because they were waiting for someone to come down that was feeling a tug on their heart. And so, yeah, walking down the front didn't wasn't what made me a child of God. It was the surrender. But then, as like I said, because of the way that uh, my schoolmates and, and others when I got focused upon people rather than upon God's responsibility for me to do, I quit doing what I was called to do, and that is evangelizing others. That so desperately needed it. In high school, a gentleman that uh, was a scientific-minded individual, and I on the school bus rides back home, I was one of the fortunate ones that was bussed out of our neighborhood all the way across to downtown from east side, because that's what they were doing at the time was trying to spread us out and bus us around. So he and I had a lot of time to discuss biblical issues. And he was one that uh, 
definitely was uh, not very receptive towards God's word, but he loved discussing it. Now, I don't know if change has ever occurred in his life, but I'm hoping our discussions planted some kind of seed. Because, yes, I didn't have all the answers to his questions, but I told him, I said, I can talk to my pastor and find out. And he'll be, well, no, that's okay. <laughs> I guess he figured I'd come back with an answer and he didn't want to hear. Because every time that I did come back after he said something like that, I did have an answer to his question. But it just gave me an opportunity to practice what I believed. And that's why I think it's so important like the opportunity we had with going to Tennessee with our youth to help in VBS to live out their testimony, to be able to share with others their life experience and their salvation experience. Because if we don't do that often enough, we do not do that on a regular basis, then I think that's what will cause us to become so involved with living life that we'll forget what God has called us to. And that is to be evangelist, reaching the lost. Yes, Dave. That is correct. God pays us for witnessing, but does not hold us for the results. That's right. We are responsible for it. That is exactly right. So what I like is that Billy Graham said this in uh, his final crusade in 2005 in Flushing, New York, or Flushing Meadows, Corona Park in New York. I have one message that Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross. He rose again. He asked us to repent of our sins and receive him by faith as Lord and Savior. And if we do, we have forgiveness of all our sins, said Graham in his final crusade. Simple message. Simply stated, but where did the power come from? It came from the Holy Spirit operating upon the hearts of those that God is bringing to him to the cross. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we're told all power is given to Jesus Christ in heaven and earth. And go, that is an imperative, go therefore. In other words, because of his power. We are to go and make disciples, that is followers. I think back to when uh, Andrew was so excited when he realized that John had pointed him to the Messiah. They had to run and tell his brother. And his brother became one of the apostles. And yet, uh, when we study the life of Peter, we find out he's just like the rest of us, very flawed, but usable if willing. And when the Holy Spirit was imparted upon him on that Pentecost day, the power that we see of those 3,000 plus men saved was all the doing of God working through a willing instrument. And that's what all he calls us to be as a willing instrument. And when I talk about willing instruments, you know, I think of, I think of Mary, the mother of Christ. She was not anything special. She was just a Jewish girl that God used as an instrument to bring into this world himself, Jesus Christ, in the form of a babe. But she was just willing to do so. Frightened, not understanding, couldn't explain it to anybody how it happened, but she was a willing instrument just like we should be. So, for many years, I've used uh, illusions, or as some call it magic. I prefer to call it illusions because that's what they actually are. It's not magic. Magic to me has bad connotations. But I use illusions that I call gospel illusions because I utilize that to present a message about Jesus Christ. In some settings, especially with young, uh, with youth, because it gets their attention and it kind of locks it into their mind of the actual message that I'm presenting. One of the favorite ones that I do 
And our former pastor's son still keeps asking me how that I did it, though he watched it multiple times. Is when that uh, I take a unopened deck of cards and have someone open it, hand me the deck of cards and I shuffle them and have them take a card and I take that card and I tear it in pieces. I take one piece, put an envelope and hand it to one person. Take the other pieces and wrap them up into a handkerchief and have another person hold on to it and make sure that they can fill the pieces of the card in that in that uh, handkerchief. And as I'm talking to them about how that uh, God works in our lives and uses those that are his children to reach out to those that are lost. I'm like, did you lose those pieces? And they're like, no, they're still here. And I'll take and grab the handkerchief and pull it out of their hand and the pieces are gone. It's a bowl of oranges on the table that I've had them look at before the illusion is done. I pick up an orange, cut it open with a knife, and in the center of it is a card, the card that they had selected, missing one piece. Then I have the person that opens up the envelope, open the envelope after I say, this orange, before I cut it, represents those of God's children that try to wrap love around those that so desperately need to know Christ or those that in their life are going through things and trials and tribulations they don't understand because they don't have a relationship with Jesus. And all the love that we do, once I cut it open, we can help put part of their life together, but they're still always missing one piece. And then I have that person open that envelope and take that piece out. The piece fits perfectly in that missing section of card and written on it is Jesus because he is the missing piece in every life. And without him, we have nothing. Because of doing illusions like that, I follow a lot of different illusionists and I've always been interested on in how they do things because that way I can have an opportunity to see how I can use particular things in an evangelistic vein to present through illusions, the gospel. And in watching this, uh, I've watched a couple of magicians, the team called Penn and Teller. I don't know if any of y'all have heard of them. Penn Gillette and uh, his partner Teller. Penn is a devout atheist. Makes no buns about it. Spoke about it. You can see some of his comments on YouTube. But... Just like I like using the illusions to make a good impression on individuals. Sometimes a person that's willing to share with even a devout atheist will make an impression that may not lead that person to Christ yet, but makes an impression because of that individual's approach. And what I want to do is I want to read to you what you can actually watch on YouTube. If you go to a gift of a Bible on YouTube, you will see a gift of a Bible. You will look, or you can put Pen Gillette, and that's spelled J I L L E T T E, Pen Gillette, P E N N, Pen Gillette, a gift of a Bible on YouTube, and watch what I'm fixing to read here. It's impressive. Penn Gillette, the verbal half of the magician duo Penn and Teller, and an outspoken atheist has posted on YouTube a video exhorting Christians to share their faith. Now, this is an atheist. Exhorting Christians to share their faith. He says, their headliners in Las Vegas and their shows are generally marked by foul language and shock appeal. And Penn Gillette, though, used no coarse language in telling about an audience member who gave him a New Testament. Gillette was signing autographs after a show last fall when he noticed a man standing over to the side of the crowd. And Penn says, and he had been the guy who picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. So they have a little interaction in, in the show. And this gentleman was the one that had been chosen to take part in it and picking a particular joke uh, in, the, in the process of uh, doing one of their illusions. In fact, uh, 
he had the props from that in his hand. The, they give those away. He had the joke book that we'd given him and the envelope and paper and stuff. Gillette said in the uh, December 8th YouTube video, the man walked over to Gillette, complimented him on the show and handed him a Gideon's New Testament. I thought you might like that, Chris. And he said, I wrote in the front of it. This is the gentleman speaking to Penn. He said, I wrote in the front of it. And I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of proselytizing. And Gillette said, and then he said, I'm a businessman. I am sane. I'm not crazy. And they looked me right in the eyes. It was really wonderful. I believe that uh, he knew that I was an atheist, but he was not defensive. He looked me right in the eyes, Gillette said, and he was truly complimentary. It didn't seem like flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me the Bible. And what he talked to him about was Jesus Christ and his need for him. Gillette then stated he doesn't respect people that don't proselytize. He said, I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people will be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, do you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward and atheists who think the people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself? He says, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? Gillette said, asked, how much, uh, um, he said, uh, how, much, uh, do you, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I, had, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I would tackle you, and that is even more important than that. Gillette reiterated his oppression of the man's demeanor. This guy was really a good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a Bible, which had uh, written in which he had written a little note in to me. Not very personal, but just liked your show, and then listed five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Gillette said. Now, I know there's no God. This is Gillette speaking from his own belief. And one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. But I will tell you, he was very, a very, very, very good man. And that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, it's okay to have that depth deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff. And that was, but that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say, Gillette said at the end of the short video. John Mark Simons, pastor of Las Vegas area Highland, Park, uh, Highland Hills Baptist Church in Henderson and a member of the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee, told the Baptist press that Gillette's video should inspire believers to share their faith even when they think people won't be responsive. This episode is a wonderful encouragement for all of us to be salt and light, Simons uh, said. If you know anything about Penn or shows, you know pretty well much he represents the decayed and dark world we live in, yet someone's obedience got his attention. You see, impression was made upon this individual that's a devout atheist, and what does he say? He said Christians need to be proselytizing. We need to be reaching out and doing so in honestly and simply but also living as much of a life as we can, as Christ-like as possible. Living out the word that we know that Christ has put down for us to live. So when others see us and we speak to them about Christ, they'll be willing to listen. I'm very fortunate, other than some, I work at a place to where that sharing, your God, sharing good news is commonplace. And you're not going to get run off if you do it because it's something that is greatly appreciated when you have an opportunity to share with someone that does not know Christ. I'm fortunate enough that because I'm all over the facility all the time, many of the residents there will come up to me and ask me to pray for them. Or they will compliment my wife of being such a wonderful biblical counselor for them and giving them some guidance. 
she always points them to Christ, <laughs> to his word, and tries to give them the right direction in their lives. And that's the same thing I try to do is to, to be there to pray with them, to help them to uh, see just exactly what God has to offer. But it's a very simple message, you know. And I guess that's what uh, I guess kind of floors me sometime when I hear that, well, I don't want to offend anybody. I got news for y'all. We're offensive to people right now without us, them not even knowing us. You know, if you're labeled as a Christian, you're offensive to a lot of people in this country now. Because, uh, you know, one thing that really stands out to me is that, you know, there's several uh, Christian films that are out about uh, after the rapture kind of along the left behind type thing, but it's showing, you know, different the, the movies made by different groups. And on these movies, they talk about Christians or haters. These are the ones that accept Christ after the rapture. Christians are haters. Got to get rid of the haters. Well, what do they hear now? They say that Christians are haters even now, even before the rapture because they don't want to hear the fact that there is a responsibility that every one of us have towards a holy God. They don't want to hear that we're sinful, that we have a dark heart, every one of us. And it's only through the grace of God and his love for us creation before we were his children, while we were still sinners, his son died for us. And people need to know that, you know, one thing that when, Penn was talking about this truck bearing down on people. Uh, Next door is a uh, app that uh, I have on my phone that tells us what's going on in the neighborhood. And yeah, uh, Friday, uh, no, yeah, it was Friday morning, I believe. I saw one to where that it was showing a video off of a ring, uh, door, uh, door ring that had been taped where this lady saw somebody's garage on fire at one o'clock in the morning. She happened to be driving by. She stopped her car, got out, rang the doorbell, pounded on the door till she finally got some response and they came out. There was two grownups and 11, uh, nine children in that home. Had she not told them their house was on fire, they would have probably perished. This world's house is on fire. Are we going to tell them about Christ? Are we going to let fear keep us from doing it? Are we going to let uh, not being socially right keep us from doing that? We need to take every opportunity that we can to tell others about Christ. This world is in one heck of a mess. And we have the solution. That is when the Heart of stone changes to a heart of flesh because of acceptance of God's word. When we have carried the message and then God's given the increase. How do we open? How do we fill the doors of the churches that seem to be diminishing today? Go out into the fields and tell. That's all we got to do. Going over to Matthew, the 21st chapter about things to come in verse 10 and this is after his uh, disciples asking him about one of these things going to come and he says he can then he continued by saying to them nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs for heaven. But before all these things, now that's really important. Before all these things, before these earthquakes, these disasters, these famines, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you to, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare for 
beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. God will give us what to say at any time. I was in the 21st chapter of uh, Luke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And verses 10 uh, through uh, 14. Uh, 15. 10 through 15. Luke 20, uh, 21, 10 through 15. The most important thing, like I said, He's talking about all these signs and stuff that's going to occur. And that is about his second coming. He said, but before all these things happen, before the seven years of tribulation, there will be those that will be carried off basically and brought before kings and governors for his namesake, but it leads an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare for beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents shall be able to resist or refute. Power of God's word, the living word, Jesus Christ, working within us, being in Christ, as the pastor so eloquently pointed out this morning. So bottom line, folks, is we have a call. We have a responsibility. If we don't like the way the world is now, we got to get busy trying to change it. Not necessarily us trying to change it, but being willing to be the instrument for God to make that change and then being available to lead these folks in what Christ taught us. Teaching them to observe all things. Because, yes, even though they may accept Christ as Lord and Savior from him working upon their heart and him giving the increase, but then we have that additional responsibility also to continue that evangelism with giving them the guidebook, the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Anybody got anything they want to add this evening before we dismiss? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because you were sitting there talking about the people asking you to pray for the big responsibility sometimes I think is on both sides. If I'm speaking to God on behalf of someone else, is he hearing me? Mm -hmm. Or do you have? It's so, it such that I've got that communication open. And sometimes we forget our responsibility in that part. It's not them. They're asking us to pray for them. Mm -hmm. They need to get things right, for sure. Yes. But then we, as Christians, need to do the same. That's quite right, Foy, as you pointed out, that uh, we as Christians have a responsibility to have our lives right with God. Confess, uh, un unconfessed sin, confessed, <clears throat> so that our prayers are effective. <clears throat> Excuse me. That just like when you read the, the verse about the prayers, the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man accomplishes much. But that word righteous there also comes from a root, means the one that is empowered by God. And so to be empowered by God, we have to have that right relationship with him to where our prayers are truly effective. <clears throat> Thanks for pointing that out. And Charles Stanley does that so well sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something that uh, in my vein of teaching, I always want to be somebody that can put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Like uh, <laughs> I've heard a favorite pastor of mine always say, that has since gone to heaven so that others will be able to understand exactly what God is saying.
I always want to be an instrument and not a hindrance, you know, because it's so easy to be a hindrance when we try to interject our words, ourselves, into what God has to say. Never want to be doing that. All right, is there anything else anybody would like to add before we dismiss? Gary, would you mind uh, dismissing us in prayer, my brother? Thank you.